Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending this first of its kind biotech meets food tech panel at the SACS conference. My name is Fiona, partner at Cookerman & Co Investment House, food tech and agritech. I'm Adam Salman, managing partner at Cookerman Investment House um, for food tech and agritech. CIH is Israel's leading private investment bank in Israel, and we do fundraising, business development, and set up strategic partnerships. I'm humbled and honored to chair this panel alongside Fiona and introduce you to our panelists who through their scientific, industrial, financial, and entrepreneurial expertise, create amazing technologies and build great bridges between the biotech and food tech ecosystem. I will let the panelists introduce themselves. Alexander? Yeah, hi everyone. This is uh, Alex Lastos. I'm based in, uh, in Zurich, Switzerland. I work for Givaldan, so we are uh, pretty much playing to the in the flavors and uh, natural food ingredient space. So very happy to be here, and I'm heading what we call front end innovation, which is mostly about open innovation with startups. Thank you, Alexander Didier. Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Didier Toubia, co-founder and CEO of Aleph Farms, a cultivated meat company. Thank you, Didier. Ilan? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ilan Sogol. I'm the CEO of uh, Bioharvest Sciences. We are, at our core, we're a biotech company. We have uh, unique platform technology that is able to bring any essential active ingredient from a plant, so a primary metabolite or secondary metabolites, and we're able to grow these essential active ingredients in cells in bioreactors, giving an amazingly soluble and bioavailable end product with very high efficacy. And looking forward to having further discussions on today's topic. Thank you. Thank you, Ilan. And now, Jonathan? Hi, I'm Jonathan, the co-founder and CEO of Bravel. We developed a unique technology, which is basically a combination of uh, fermentation with light. These are the first uh, globally, which, which combined the, the two aspects. And with this, we are able to, to provide alternative protein uh, to the global market, which is uh, flavor neutral and, and, and at the cost parity with pea protein from microalgae, which is uh, uh, the most uh, sustainable source of protein uh, available. And we do this with our unique technology we develop. Thank you, Jonathan. I will start with my first question. Today, we are aware the world is facing many problems related to the way we nourish ourselves. By 2050, the world's population is predicted to reach 9.7 billion people. And we will need double the planet size to support humanity's demand. How are food tech companies solving those issues? Maybe I can, uh, I can start uh, from our side. So yeah, I guess we can still consider ourselves a food tech company. So uh, we are uh, enabling that space uh, quite a lot and working with, uh, with startups, but I would leave uh, you know, most of that uh, emerging innovation, it's coming you know, from, uh, from our, let's say uh, friends on the startup board. And I think, what I see quite a lot, you know, is, uh, is trying to bring like this more sustainable and, uh, you know, uh, uh, type of food, right? So uh, I, I see, you know, eliminating or, you know, I like this quote from a startup that they say, you know, we are in, in the case of meat, we are skipping the cow and going directly to proteins and that, you know, eliminating all the environmental impact. So that's one, one element. I think, you know, things from, uh, you know, plant-based uh, products that they were the first ones to come. Uh, now we see also all the cellular agriculture. We see plant molecular farming coming to play. We see plant cell culture and all of them trying to provide alternatives that are more sustainable, more scalable, and that can, you know, uh, demand less from the environment. Uh, there are still challenges over there for sure. Um, you know, to still deliver like delightful and great, uh, you know, products to the consumers. But that's how I see it. It's mostly to look into this 
more sustainable, uh, more nutritional, less harm for consumers and for the environment. I can, I can maybe add that there's, I, I completely agree with, with Alex. Um, I, see, I see different companies approaching this, this challenge from different ang angles. Some are going through to the cellular uh, agriculture and culture-based uh, meat, um, and others are coming from, from the plant-based solutions. With, these are two complementary solutions, which the whole food tech industry is working on uh, from different angles. And I see them complementary because there are different needs that each of these approaches uh, solves. And all of the, the plant-based solutions are more gradually moving into uh, more, more sophisticated, more advanced indoor solutions uh, into fermentation and other uh, types of technologies uh, moving from, from the outside in, inside, which is much more sustainable and enables much more significant uh, uh, control in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the growing process, which is essential to really solve global challenges of uh, nutrition and food charity. I also think in, you know, in, in the plant world today, which is obviously the world that we live in, there's no doubt that you know, over 2000 years of evolution, the plants themselves have you know, developed the appropriate molecular phytochemicals to be able to provide the critical active ingredients that we as human beings need from an overall health and wellness perspective. But you know, generally, just given the world that we're living in today, um, these plants are heavily challenged. You know, climatic conditions means there's a tremendous lack of consistency. And as we bring these critical phytochemicals into the food system or the nutrition system, we need to have consistency. Um, and that's always been a very, you know, a, a major challenge. At the same time, as you know, we've started to see companies in the last 10 to 15 years look to extract these phytochemicals, there's a heavy, heavy burden on the environment, um, let alone the consistency. Also a heavy burden as a result of using solvents. So you're not getting a, a level of, of purity that you need. And um, you know, when we start to look at the technologies that are around today, we, we're very, very privileged that we have today technologies and platform technologies that are able to grow these critical active medicinal compounds from the plants in ways that um, ensure that from an overall consistency, we have fingerprint consistency of the active molecule, which is so important when you bring it through the supply chain all the way through to an end consumer product, as well as in ways that are ensuring that you have that that cleanliness, which is, again, so important through the supply chain, no heavy metals and no use of other components that people don't want as part of their diets. And then obviously doing it in a way which um, is sustainable from an environmental perspective, because at the end of the day, you know, the consumers voting very, very hard on the sustainability side, but they're also looking for the quality and the consistency. So, you know, we're very lucky today that we're, we, we have those technologies available we were able to kind of balance what the key stakeholders need from a consumer perspective, all the way through to also the food companies or um, themselves, the brand owners themselves. I would also add that, that the, the, current, um, the current food ecosystem and agricultural ecosystem are really facing some challenges, which are some of the most pressing challenges of all times in terms of uh, sustainability, of uh, food security, of ethics, in terms of um, public health. And we really need to, to drive what we call the fourth agricultural revolution, uh, which is uh, moving away from uh, focusing on quantities and actually following the incorporation of uh, new agrochemicals after the, the Second World War, which was intended to increase the, the quantity of food produced to feed the, the people and the growing population after the, the Second World War, we, 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 found, we find ourselves in a world now where the, the quality of the food has uh, been uh, reduced as, uh, as, uh, as it, is, it has been discussed, but also the, the amount of resources we use is too much. The, um, the focus has been on, uh, on calories and not necessarily on nutrition and not necessarily on feeding the people. We're throwing away one third of our food while close to 900 million people in the world today um, don't have access to um, enough uh, food. So there, there's a mismatch between the production and the consumption of the food and the overall system has been optimized 
for efficiencies and quantities, not for feeding the people. And this revolution we need to, to drive uh, will rely on new production systems, on uh, uh, deep tech innovation to produce um, always more food, but of better quality with less resources. And that's a huge challenge, which we believe the, the conventional companies can't uh, necessarily um, uh, overcome by their own. And we'll need uh, startups, more agile, more innovative uh, bodies to really support this transition, which is a real revolution. It's not just um, not just an evolution. And that leads me to my next to our next question. What is the biggest challenge faced in cellular agriculture, cell-based products? Yeah, so I guess it's for me. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so Alephans is a. Uh, is one of the leading companies in the space of cultivated meat, which is uh, uh, actually growing meat directly from cells. We harvest from a healthy cow. The, the cells are the building blocks of the meat we know today. Just uh, instead of letting the cells continuously um, divide and organize themselves into a steak, into a muscle tissue inside an animal, we isolate the cells from the, from the cow, transfer them into a controlled environment, which mimics the same conditions as inside the body of the animal, so that the cells continue to divide, organize themselves uh, in a stack, but on the outside under control conditions, which is in our views a new form of domestication. Instead of domesticating the whole animal, and we domesticate the edible part of the animal. So it's a, a direct evolution of uh, the agriculture we know today. We call it cellular agriculture because it's about farming cells and farming tissues, um, as opposed to farming uh, the whole the whole animal. It's an emerging space, which, as I mentioned before, will be a new category of food beside uh, conventional uh, food products, uh, plant-based, probably fermentation-based. There's also a strong push of uh, single cell um, organisms as a source of food. So cellular agriculture is one category which is um, developing today. There aren't any products yet um, approved in the market. Um, there are probably a few tens, few dozens of companies working on those uh, technologies. And uh, we, we expect to see more products launched over the course of the next 12 to 24 months. And um, so there are still some challenges ahead to your question. Um, I believe the main challenges are related to, to the cost issue, uh, same as many other innovations. It's inherently expensive at small scale. And we need to in increase the, the quantities and to drive economies of scale in order to make those uh, products compet competitive. But not only the scale, it, it also requires um, uh, adaptation of uh, um, original technologies which have been transferred from the biomedical industry and the biotech industry for, for medical applications and to um, transform those uh, platforms and those technologies to make them suitable for food in terms of uh, scale and cost structure. It's also about developing different processes than the ones uh, used for um, biomedical applications, developing different equipment. So a lot of innovation required to drive this cost down. In parallel, um, there's a challenge of, for um, scaling up uh, those processes, which are biological processes. And uh, biology is always uh, um, challenging to, to scale. And uh, the co consumer acceptance should be very high based on the many consumer studies which have been performed in the industry and by other firms itself as well. I believe it's still important to make sure that we develop the right technology platform that, and the right product that will target the right uh, consumers with the right positioning and communication to succeed. So I would say that uh, uh, even through it sounds like a walk in the park uh, marketing wise, I believe there are still some uh, important aspects to take, uh, to take into account when we launch those products. Jonathan, anything to add on that? Yeah, I'd like to expand on Didier's uh, point about cost. We're, we're facing a huge barrier in terms of the, the, the benchmark we have to compare with is, in, in Didier's case, it's uh, beef. In our case, it's uh, soy protein or pea protein, which are really commodities. And we, uh, one, one, one approach, I mean, one thing we have to do is really work at, at really large scales and have economics of scales. But also, it requires. This is also the other. They also spoke about it. Um, it. It requires really sophisticated technological innovation to be able to leap this gap. Not only brute force our way through it, but really find solutions that enable us to leap the gap um, and arrive at cost parity with with the existing benchmarks. Because otherwise, I mean, if you have uh, amazing uh, um, uh, beef uh, cultivated in in in, uh, in fermenters. 
or sustainable protein produced from macroalgae, if it's not at cost parity with the existing products in the market, it won't be relevant beyond niche applications. Thank you, Jonathan. So now it brings us to our next question. What is the role of the biotech ecosystem in the development of food technic technologies? Uh, I'll take a stab at that um, for the first time. <clears throat> Look, I, I think ultimately the, the two are very closely fused together. Um, and they, they, they need to coexist together. And if you, if you look at, say, for example, the food technology ecosystem, when you look at food technologies today, there are a number of, 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 dri of drivers on each of the different platforms in this area. And it could be, for example, sustainability is a major area. The other area is, you know, specifically what we've dealt with as a global, um, as a global economy in the last two years with, um, with COVID and how health and wellness is on really the, the frontal lobe of every single person um, out there. Um, and so, you know, given the food system, major companies out there, whether you're talking about snack foods, you're talking about beverages, uh, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, more, more conventional um, types of, of pastas, all the way through, companies are looking on how they can add better health and wellness credentials to their products. And they are looking for breakthrough disruptive technologies in order for them to differentiate in each of the different um, segments that they are looking to lead. At the same time, companies are looking for premiumization. They're looking for the ability to actually charge more anchored in consumer needs. And that consumer need at the end of the day is all coming back to you know, health and wellness. Um, so the biotech um, sector is really has the ability to be able to drive and, 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 and feature though, um, and, and provide the impetus for the uh, major food companies out there to be able to provide them with uh, you know, unique active compounds to be able to utilize them um, as foods and let food be an actual carrier for these specific unique active ingredients. Uh, I give you an example. You know, we we sell uh, a unique product in the marketplace. It's called Vinia. It's based on the, on the French paradox. Um, yeah, we sell it as a dietary supplement, but also it can be sold as a as a food. We're registered as a food in the U.S. And the, the product itself um, it, um, has been um, has been clinically demonstrated to increase the dilation of one's arteries, and uh, i.e., increasing overall blood flow. Um, and we, as I said, we can sell it as a dietary supplement, but we're also today in discussions with multiple major uh, giants of different um, segments because they're looking for that differentiation that they can actually make claims, health and wellness driven claims to their end consumers related to, for example, this product, by consuming this product every single day, it will, you know, it will increase your blood flow, which will give you more physical energy and mental alertness as a result of increased delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the body, tissue, and organ. So the, these are how the two pieces come together. The biotech are kind of in a way, we're kind of stuck in a corner to some extent, just based on whether kind of on the technology side. But then, you know, when we bring ourselves to industry and we start to touch industry that are so, excuse the pun, they're so hungry for this in innovation to be able to really deliver on the health and wellness credentials that the end consumer today more than ever is ultimately looking for. So this is kind of like how the two worlds come together and, and really fuse to create ultimately uh, a much stronger delivery on existing unmet consumer needs. Because at the end of the day, consumer is king. Didier, would you like to add something to this? Uh, yes, I think that uh, in order to drive this uh, fourth agricultural revolution, which is uh, coming after the um, agrochemical revolution and the um, uh, mechanic, uh, mechanical revolution, we need, to, we need to invest in two levels of innovations. One is to um, improve the existing production systems and the, the other level of innovation is to develop new production systems beside um, uh, optimized or more sustainable uh, um, versions of the existing um, of the existing uh, uh, methods for producing food. And biotech has a role in both. If we're looking, for instance, at, uh, at the mid sector, which is the sector where other farms is uh, active, in, in the 
in incremental innovation intended to make uh, cattle uh, farming more sustainable, the study of the microbiome has a, a great uh, impact on uh, the ability to reduce methane emissions by cattle. And we see more and more uh, companies uh, dealing and, and studying um, applying to, to animal uh, science and, and the um, animal production science. A lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, know-how and research which has been originally developed for humans. And if we talk about the other category of innovation, which is uh, more deep tech, more uh, radical innovation, like cultivated meat, for instance, Aleph Farms, as an example, have been uh, started based on a tech transfer from uh, the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology, working very closely with uh, Professor Levenberg, who is a, a worldwide renowned researcher in the field of tissue engineering. She's been working for 20 years on uh, growing pieces of organs for um, the purpose of uh, uh, fixing uh, diseased, uh, diseased tissues in human medicine. And we've been working with her on applying this uh, platform originally intended for regenerative medicine into growing uh, pieces of uh, muscle tissue from bovine origin for uh, food uh, um, for food applications. Um, the OVP R&D and the CTO today is uh, coming from the stem cells industry. I uh, worked for a long time at uh, Academy STEM and as a postdoc from UCLA in the US in, uh, in stem cells, uh, coming from, um, from the therapeutic uh, field as well and applying her know-how into developing um, pluripotent cell lines from a bovine origin. And, and we see this uh, transition from a biotech know-how into and new production systems for, for food happening everywhere, including in all the fermentation-based um, production systems, for instance, and, and a lot of the, uh, the innovation we need uh, relies and builds on uh, uh, platforms which have been uh, developed for biomedical applications originally. I'd like to, to add here, uh, also to continue again from Didier and also relate to what I said earlier about bridging the gap, uh, the technology that is needed for the for this revolution in the food industry is actually very similar to the technology that exists in the pharma in the biotech ecosystem. Just a, as a curious example, our uh, in our scientific advisory advisory board, we have the CTO of Merck, Israel, and 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 actually that the the bioreactors we have are very similar to what you would expect to have in the pharma industry, and this is the level of technological development. Which is which, which has to be uh, found outside of the current food industry, which is actually the biotech industry. So there's actually, I would see it as a as a continuum where uh, the the applications in the food industry must have the support and the technology available in the pharma industry. And that actually leads me to my next question again. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, why is it so important for food technologies to partner with industry giants? And I guess we'll start with Alexandra and go on to Jonathan and Elon. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when, when I look and the, and the first question was, uh, yeah, like uh, what the food tech companies are doing. And I think they are trying to change uh, again, like the status quo, right? There are different types of technologies that people are trying but at the end is you know looking at the system we have today as it was saying you know there are you know major uh, pain points uh, you know for the environment but also like uh, some some things that would impact uh, the consumer as well in terms of safety and health and and, um, and then they are coming back with all these technologies that uh, uh, um, Yonata said that sometimes come from one industry to the other, but then it's all new to that industry, right? All this, uh, you know, uh, the cultivated meat, there is a lot, you know, that is coming from pharma, you know, like uh, uh, growing tissue and, you know, uh, cells and all of that. You have uh, all other technologies that they are all together new to the world, right? And I think while you have the inventors or the innovators, you know, bringing this, uh, into play uh, with the support from the VCs. Uh, the thing is that the global companies or the, the, the big companies, the big corporates, they can support in many different ways. And I, I put this in different buckets to me. And this is one part we like. Actually, we like to accelerate the development already. So working you know, together to say, okay, uh, you know, with our you know, knowledge, with our 
uh, infrastructure with our reach in research, how can we accelerate the development of your IP? And, and this is something sometimes it's difficult to do that conversation, but we have had some very success stories, you know, on how we say, you know, your IP is your IP. We just want to accelerate because we want to see that innovation out there. So the, the development is already something. Then you go into scale. And that's what we are masters of. <laughs> We've been scaling things forever, right? And, uh, and we say that the scaling is a science on its own. Sometimes we find innovators and they, they, they come up with like something really cool, really nice at the lab scale. And we say, fantastic. But then going to the next level, well, that's a whole new business. And this is also, again, where the big companies can help with infrastructure, but also with a lot of knowledge. And then finally, the big companies can also say, hey, you know what? We already have the way to market. And this is also where we can speed up, you know, the access to market for, for the companies as well. At least this is the way uh, we are looking at, you know, also as a, as, a, as a backbone as well, looking to like, how can we also help in terms of funding? But I think these other two things, you know, co-development, scaling and go to market is really essential. And especially in the food, actually another area I would mention is all the regulatory. And this I find very interesting because this is, again, we are, you know, uh, working with the food agencies, you know, all the time. We have a lot of expertise. We understand like, you know, we have specialists that understand the laws and, uh, you know, all the details about, you know, how you can bring like this new food, new technology. And this is another asset where, you know, the, the industry giants can help uh, the startups as well. So for me, at, at the end, it's really, you know, the startups will bring the IP and then the food giants, they can bring all the infrastructure, the knowledge to accelerate and bring it to market. I, I can add the, the perspective from our side which I, I can say that Alex is exactly on the point here. We, uh, uh, the giants, the, the corporates bringing their expertise and infrastructure is actually, it's a crucial step for small startups because I can give a specific example, which is actually something we've done with uh, Jibudan. Um, in order to, to get to cost parity with, with pea protein, for example, we, uh, as a, as a, as a plant-based uh, source, microalgae, we must be able to valorize each and every fraction of the biomass. And in, independently, if we had to, to find the, to develop the product from each and every fraction, we wouldn't, uh, I mean, it would be impossible. And with Jibudan, we developed actually, a, uh, we, we took a single fraction with Jibudan, uh, have all of the path already to, to the market. And together with them, we developed a, a unique uh, product for, for one of the fractions, which is again, something that independently, we wouldn't have never reached that point if we wouldn't, would have, wouldn't have done it with, with uh, with someone with with someone expert in the market, with all of the capabilities and all of the inf infrastructure, and then a knowledge of what the market wants for the specific uh, fraction. I just want to add that you know when you look at this uniqueness of this relationship between um, food tech companies and the major giants, the the flow of value goes both ways. And actually, when you when you look at those food tech companies that have actually made it. In most cases, they've had critical partnerships at different junctures in their commercialization, R&D and commercialization history, um, where the, the major food giant has significantly added value that got them over the line when they hit some critical challenges. And I just want to touch on a few areas here, you know, based on myself, just having 18 years of experience working with the Coca-Cola company. Um, you know, you, one can't um, value enough the importance of food tech companies working with these giants so that they can understand their end-to-end -end value chain, the whole end-to-end -end supply chain from literally procurement all the way through to the end consumer. And just take, for example, when you're bringing new technologies to the marketplace, you need to understand the, man the, the manufacturing processes of these giants. Because many of these giants have been manufacturing the same products for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. And as, as uh, Alexander said, they're doing it at such scale. You have to figure out how your technology is going to be able to really sync 
with their existing manufacturing technology because it doesn't matter how what what benefit you're delivering if it's not able to sync effectively and efficiently with the current manufacturing processes with limited capital requirements it's not going to get over the line so this is one area the other key area i can't emphasize enough and maybe it's just given my background is on the consumer side because what these companies do they give you access to their consumers and ultimately you have to understand their products the whole sensory experience that the consumer has and the relationship that they have with those particular brands and whether it's unique sweetness systems or it's you know alternative you know forms of you know plant based meat or, or whatever it is you know you have to do that research with the consumer to be able to get the feedback and to continuously modify your products so ultimately the technology that you're bringing to the marketplace is providing unique benefits whether it's nutritional benefits whether it's sustainability benefits but not trading off any part of the sensory experience and the access to customers and also to consumers is a is a critical path to walk in order for you to be able to get success from a commercialization perspective however don't underestimate how important as i touched on earlier those food techn the technologies that those um, that those food technology companies are bringing to the market are even for the giants because it's it's interesting you know the giants they they run businesses they do have r and d departments but they're operating you know based on certain swim lanes and, and many times there's technologies that come outside of their swim lanes that come from blind spots that they hadn't thought of before but they realize wow this is a major differentiator for us in the marketplace and a significant way for us to create greater value creation with our end consumers and that's going to be ultimately drive more loyalty and more bottom line so they need these food technology companies and that's why even here in, you have in Israel you have PepsiCo that has a major team looking at technologies you have ABM Bev that has a major team here looking at food technologies so and I commend you know there are another 10 other major giants that are here in our ecosystem looking end to end across the value chain for those technologies so what's great is it's it's a symbiotic relationship where there's benefits that flow to each of the partners and when when the people at the table understand that that's when ultimately it becomes a significant win win and you create value for all stakeholders um, within the within the industry Speaking of value, uh, we believe more and more biotech funds are looking at food tech companies. We would love to hear the panelists' thoughts on what the future of food tech investors look like. Um, Elon or Didier, whoever prefers to get started there, and then we'd love to hear from Jonathan as well. Go ahead, Didier. I'm taking a breather. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I think it's uh, something probably we're experiencing, uh, you know, as, as a group of uh, food tech companies, you know, the food is based on uh, living uh, raw materials, you know, um, plants, uh, animals are living, living entities and, and living organisms. Um, we're talking about uh, fermentation, about uh, cell culture. And, and it's clear that for the, this transition of the food system to Q, we need to, to drill down deeper into the molecular and the molecular biology aspect of the food we produce, which is directly connected to, to biotech. And uh, um, I think that if until, uh, let's say, 10 years ago, most of the innovation in food was really, you know, a new equipment for making a production process more efficient or a certain uh, a uh, change in the formulation or receipt of a product. Today, we see the, the food tech industry really drilling very um, in depth into the, the, the biology, the source of the food. Um, and it's clear that uh, that being said, that, that being said, that there is a, a win-win um, of uh, biotech investors investing in, uh, in uh, food tech startups on one hand, the, the biotech investors have an advantage over classical uh, food tech VCs because they, they do understand the, the science and the technology, the regulatory uh, processes, which are uh, associated with the, uh, those platforms, uh, the risks, the timelines, um, and, and can better assess the, the, those, new, uh, those new opportunities uh, than uh, um, classical, let's say, let's say or historical food tech investors who don't necessarily have the capabilities. 
And for the for the company itself, it's uh, um, it's also uh, beneficial because uh, raising from a biotech uh, VCs is a way to really build a real uh, collaboration on a longer term with sophisticated investors who speak the same language. And for instance, at Alephans, we raised uh, part of our Series A from Peregrine Ventures in Israel, which is um, a firm focusing on uh, on biomedical, biotech, and uh, and medical equipment. And it has been a great uh, choice for us. Um, we believe that, uh, and, and even in the another of our investors, uh, from Singapore, the partner who sits as oh, on board uh, has a PhD in uh, um, in cellular bio in uh, um, cellular biology. Um, and he's actually uh, really bringing a lot of insights and of understanding of what we do. Yeah, I was just um, just going to add to that. I, I think that what we'll see, if not we're seeing it right now, is is a is a convergence of the food tech investor and the biotech investor. Um, you know, because their worlds are fusing so closely together. Um, just based on where the industry where the industry is going and what the key trends are so you know whether it's health and wellness or whether it's sustainability you know <clears throat> ultimately those food tech investors are looking for you know much deeper r d game-changing platform technologies that are able to tick the boxes you know in delivering you know breakthrough nutrition for the end consumer and whilst at the same time being able to do this in a way which uh, which is really preserving the, the you know the, the sustainability credentials are real and they purposeful and it's not just you know marketing green it's it's real green so I think you know they're gonna you know you're gonna find that food tech investors and it's happening already we you know we see it in in, in the in the dialogues that we're having you know on a, on a regular basis um, with these key parties that there's a level of unique sophistication um, there's a level of knowledge uh, in the biotech space. Um, and they and, and they are really you know coming together and fusing as one, and I actually think it's good for the industry because it it um, the the fusion just demonstrates the the opportunity that's out there um, for these investors as far as really bringing game changing technologies ultimately being commercialized to the marketplace, um, whereby you know bi food tech you know food just becomes a vehicle for biotech to move to actually. For, to, to move their products ultimately to the end consumer. So um, I, I think it's going to be, um, it's going to continue to happen and it's, and it's going to happen very, very quickly. I'd, I'd like to add here that I actually see a, a transition happening in the food tech uh, investor community. Um, but still, many food tech investors are still looking for the next uh, food delivery app or food, food related apps. And we need more and more investors that are, that are more sophisticated, more uh, tech savvy in terms of really developing more sophisticated uh, technology that have the, the, the patience that these kinds of companies need to, 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 to grow. I mean, developing large scale uh, fermenters for, for meat or for macroalgae or for uh, uh, biochemicals, uh, I mean, the, uh, we need the, the patients that usually biotech investors have and the understanding of the processes and everything my, my colleagues uh, mentioned here as well, understanding the regulation, understanding the, the processes that need to be taken, understanding the, 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 the vast scope of technology that, that has to be implemented and so on. So really, think, as, as Inan said. I think that's uh, a really important point uh, that Jonathan made just around the, the, the time horizon of the investor has to somewhat change as they start to re really, as this fusion happens, it has to be more of a balanced time horizon. And whether that's, you know, individual investors, whether it's VCs, they need to be looking at, you know, basically longer longer end-to-end -end development times until technology is actually commercialized to the marketplace on one hand. But ultimately when it does get commercialized, the ability to scale it is major and the ROI, you know, in many cases, is much greater than what they would normally be seeing traditionally in 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 in, in I would say more basic food tech um, types of innovation that they're touching on an everyday basis. So that time horizon uh, is going to be very very important. Um, otherwise, um, you're going to have a lot of disappointed food tech investors. Actually, one uh, one you know one one data point here, like in our uh, you know experience and journey 
when, when we started this um, like seven years ago, we would see a lot of investment uh, just going for the kind of the next consumer product, right? And uh, with like novel concepts, but uh, the technology, the IP wouldn't be that strong. But of course, the, 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 the return on investment would be sooner, right? Because you could scale that like much faster. And we were like desperate to see more high tech. And, uh, and, and now we see this, actually, if you take the example, for instance, now of Perfect Day, I think it's one of the best funded startups, 700 million. And this is precision fermentation, right? So it's in the biotech space. And, and we see now that the, the investors are going more and more into that. And I, I, I just have to say that I'm super happy because these are the areas where we, we want to see also you know, more capital coming and enabling those, uh, those innovations. Yeah. And one, one other point that, that I, I think people might find interesting is that the, the other big change is the regulation mindset. And when you're in the food tech space, you know, you're dealing with clear cut regulations based on, you know, what has been traditional food law, as an example, the last 50 years. Okay. And in some parts of the world, certain geographies, certain segments, you see very, very little change. As you kind of jump into biotech, it's the biotech that's continuously thinking through as part of their R&D processes, different ways of doing things, which may, you know, when it comes to a food law perspective, they've never even thought about it, hasn't even, you know, come to the table. So I think this is also uh, having a level of appreciation of this and understanding that it's, you know, it's, it's not doing things every single day or, or looking at technology that's a tick the box from a regulation perspective. It's understanding that you're gonna see breakthrough technology and you're gonna, these companies are gonna to have to partner with regulators, obviously go through the appropriate approval processes, but that does take time. And that does sometimes increase a little bit of the risk factor. So these are the kind of you know, paradigms that I think the, the food tech investors will have to start to get used to as they start to kind of you know, go deeper into the biotech world. Thank you, Iran, for this. Um, and our next question, uh, one of the major consumer trends we are seeing today is also the desire to live a healthier life, starting with changing the way we nourish ourselves. Where do you think this segment is going? And we'd love to hear Alexander and uh, Ilan on this. Yeah, th this is also interesting. And like we, when, when we saw more and more innovation, like, you know, around uh, sustainability and of course, I always say that uh, food is like this amazing matrix, right? Uh, with many different things. And then at the beginning, people were just looking about, you know, okay, how can I remove the protein, for instance, and add another source of protein? But then the, the first gap was like the texture, right? Okay, how can I mimic the texture? How can I deliver like uh, something, you know, that is uh, texture wise is good? And then people working on taste. And at the beginning, people were not really looking too much into the health part, right? And now we see more and more, not just into these more sustainable food options, right? But actually in general, like the, the consumer is definitely demanding that besides the pleasure that the food delivers to them, that they want to use, you know, food as a medicine, right? Like to prevent to actually, you know, nourish them and kind of get them, you know, with their, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, uh, body, uh, you know, more ready and kind of more capable of like, you know, performing better. And that goes into many different directions. I mean, COVID just kind of boosted this, you know, everybody's looking for solutions that can, you know, boost their immune system. You have, you know, also like in this, times of like so much stress, you know, so much pressure, people are like, okay, how can I have food that can help me, you know, relax and have like a good time, you know, recovering my energy. At the same time, on the other hand, you have people like, hey, I want to perform my best. I want my energy to be up. So all these demands are out there. And while people in the past, they would be looking for you know, maybe more on the health area. People are like, you know, why my food cannot provide this to me so that while I'm nourishing myself and there is this aspect of naturality, I also get all these benefits 
there's health benefits, you know, in my day-to-day, -day, you know, diet. So I think this is going to go and, and grow more and more. There is also the element we mentioned, you know, about safety as well. So one thing is like, how can I avoid the diseases, right? And then people are really conscious about this. But it's also like, you know, how can I bring more, you know, into my diet? So to me, it's one of the big areas, uh, you know, in this space. It's hard one. So we have Elon here to talk about that. It's not easy, right? I mean, one thing is like perception. Oh, you know, I heard from my grandma that, you know, if you eat this, it's going to be good for you. But, you know, bringing this to the industry, you need to get the claims, right? You need to do your clinical trials. And this is a hard space, but I really hope that the investors come and help the startups, you know, to boost this because we as consumers, we need more options in, in that as well. It's, I think it's uh, it's it's a great perspective from Alexandra, and, and you know, the cons it's not where the consumer is going; it's where the consumer has gone quickly, gone. And you know, consumer are are very much you know their their behavior is totally correlated to their experiences. And you look at what consumers have experienced in the last two years. Um, as I said earlier, the whole notion um, of health and wellness is 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 present more and more in people's lives than ever before. Consumers' relationship with the earth, purposeful relationship with the earth is getting stronger and stronger, you know, as it relates to the power of the plant in bringing, you know, unique nourishment to people all the way through to the importance of leaving this world in a better place for our children and grandchildren and really voting and making sure that we are buying products and, 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 and brands that have best in class, real not marketing, but real sustainability credentials. And, and, and you know, consumers are, 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 are realizing and, and their knowledge, their deep knowledge um, of these areas is, is unbelievable because people today, they have access to everything. You know, it's just a Google search away and you can go deep, deep, deep and you can understand, people can look at our patents, people can look at our clinical trials. Literally they have access to absolutely everything. And, and that's amazing. It's amazing for those companies that, that are operating on the, I would say, the positive end of, of, the, of the whole, let's call it um, ethical, ethical, ethical approach to everything that you do across the business. Um, and I think, you know, we see it today, people going back to the plant, we see it across all the different categories, we see it in our business, you know, we're, we're a, a platform technology that leverages the power of the plant and the active medicinal ingredients in the plant and specifically the full spectrum. It's not just about singular isolates today. Uh, it's not just about synthetic compounds from big pharma. People are realizing the power of full spectrum. We see this probably most prevalent in the world of cannabis. Um, and you see today, you know, how people are moving to cannabis for specifically health and wellness needs, whether it's to address ADD, ADHD challenges, or it's to work through um, pain management challenges um, or, or, or dealing with sleep management challenges. People are not looking for the, 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 the sleeping tablet, synthesized sleeping tablet. They're realizing we need to go back to the plant. There's a reason why, you know, literally God put 500,000 plants on, on this world in, in, in day three of the overall creation of the world. And, and they're also realizing the power of those collective active ingredients that plants have and then obviously there are companies today where one of the co these companies that are leading the charge on bringing the power of these active compounds to people so they can really start to live life differently um, in a way which is which is anchored in harmony with the earth that we're living in by putting in active ingredients into your body that as alexander said they are consistent they have gone through um, the appropriate regulatory process. They've gone through the appropriate clinical trials and being validated to be able to actually deliver on specific benefits that they're claiming um, all the way through to actually having real sustainability credentials. Um, and I think that trend, the train has left the station and it's just catching more and more speed. Um, and we're going to see that accelerate because I think the... The, the headwinds that, that we are facing today from a health and wellness plus the tailwinds are all moving 
in the right direction for this to become a central part of how people live their lives um, in, in, in the next five, 10 years, it'll be an anchored part of their overall consumer behavior. Thank you, Ilan. Um, I would like to ask, is there anyone that wants to add something, has a note, a, another comment, or something that you think that is important to mention in this biotech meets food tech panel? Say that in our views, the future of food tech is biotech, <laughs> but the future of biotech is food tech as well, meaning I think it's really uh, coming both ways. And uh, who is not saying that is um, missing a great opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, and I would just add, uh, I, I think Didier kind of coined it perfectly. The, the, the other element I would add is that this all has to be done in the context of a world where we have purposeful sustainability, right? And, and, and if we are able to wrap the sustain, real sustainability story, it's a win-win for everybody. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed our food tech meets biotech panel and uh, even increase your food tech and ag tech exposure this quarter. Uh, we're here to host you at our offices in Tel Aviv, uh, where there are cutting edge innovations, uh, helping us resolve our issues on this planet uh, when it comes to food tech and, and feeding the world. Uh, there's more unicorns per capita than anywhere else currently in Tel Aviv, and we'd love to host you when you come. Thank you very much for your time, and congratulations on your success. Thank you to all our panelists, and uh, it's an honor to advise uh, such a great company. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, we, really, we really appreciate your new hairstyle.